Il est économiste et chercheur au Future Humanity Institute. Merci d'accueillir sur scène Robin Hanson. This is all of history in one graph. On the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the growth rate. Both axes have been compressed logarithmically, so you can see it all together. History is well summarized as a sequence of exponential growth modes. During each mode, growth was steady, and then there was a sudden transition to a much faster rate. Human foragers doubled roughly every quarter million years. Then, about 10,000 years ago, a sudden transition to farmers, doubling roughly every 1,000 years. A few hundred years ago, the Industrial Revolution started our economy doubling roughly every 15 years. If this trend were to continue, then roughly sometime in the next century or so, there would be another transition to a new growth rate that doubled roughly every month. Transition with less than 10 years to that new sudden growth rate, and that would last for only a year or two, and then something else would happen. Sounds crazy, right? What could possibly cause a transition that big? The standard speculation about one of the biggest things that could happen is a transition to artificial intelligence, robots as smart as people. How could that happen? One route is that we'll slowly accumulate more better software as we've been doing for the last 70 years. At past rates of progress, that will take centuries. Some people hope we're going to have a sudden burst of a progress with some great powerful new theory. I'm skeptical, but I'm here to talk about a third scenario, brain emulation. The scenario is to port the software that's already in your head. Today, if you have an old computer running software you like and you want software like that running on a new computer, one approach is to stare at the software, try to guess how it works, and then write software on the new computer that works how you think it works on the old computer. But another approach is to write what's called an emulator that makes the new computer look like the old one to the software. If you can write an emulator, then you can just move the software over without understanding it, and it just works. So the idea is to do that for the human brain. To do that, we'll need three technologies to be good enough. None of them are there yet, and plausibly, they may take another century or more. The first is we're going to need a lot of cheap, fast, parallel computers. Secondly, we're going to need to scan individual human brains in fine spatial and chemical detail to see which cells are where and connected to what. And then third, we're going to need models, computer models of how each kind of brain cell works taking signals in, changing internal state, and sending signals out. If we can have a good enough model of all the different kinds of cells, a good enough scan, we can put them all together into a good enough computer model that, by definition, will have the same input-output behavior. It will do the same thing in the same circumstances. And when this becomes cheap, everything changes. The concept of a brain emulation, I call it M for short, it's also been called uploads, has been a staple of science fiction and futurism going back many decades. When the subject comes up, people usually ask, can I tell a story there? Is this even possible? If you made one, is it conscious or is it just an empty machine? If you made an emulation of me, is that me or someone else? These are all fascinating questions that I'm going to ignore. <laughs> because I think there's been a neglected question, which is, what would actually happen? Most of the people who do technology forecasting and futurism, like me, when I was an undergraduate in physics, they're told social science doesn't exist. They make it up. And so they don't tend to think it's possible to forecast a future like this. And that's why I've written a detailed book that took years where I tried to work out in great detail what this world would look like. And I'm here to tell you what the world's like. However, be warned. I'm not here to inspire you, I'm just here to present analysis. If you aren't disturbed by at least something I say, you're probably not paying attention. 
Okay, the first thing I can tell you is that M spends most of their lives in virtual reality. In virtual reality, they never need to feel pain or hunger, grime or disease. Their bodies can always be beautiful. When you're in virtual reality, you notice that it's not real, but for them it can be as real as this room seems to you. Now, this is what you would look like in virtual reality, wearing some goggles or something, but this is what you would see you might see the sunlight glinting off the water. You might hear the seagulls above. In, with really good hardware, you might feel the wind on your cheeks or smell the sea breeze. You might need a dashboard to do some things. You might want to call someone, uh, change virtual worlds. You might want to manage your bank account. Now, while this is what you would look like when you're in virtual reality, this is what an M would look like. It really is computer hardware sitting in a server rack somewhere. But from its point of view, it can still see the same thing. And in fact, it has more abilities than you do. It can change its speed. If the world around it seems to be going too fast to manage, it can just speed up, and the world around it will seem to slow down. It costs more to speed up, and it's cheaper to run slow. It can make a copy of itself. That copy starts out with all the same memories and abilities, looking at the same scene, at which point it will need to be told, you are the copy. <laughs> it could also make an archive copy of itself, allowing it to be in principle immortal, though not usually in practice. It could also move where its brain is, where that hardware is. And by moving to some other location, it could then interact more easily with other M's near that location. Now, We've been saying what the world looks like, but what do the M's choose to do? In order to figure that out, we need to know some key facts about emulations. The first is, by definition, they do exactly what the human they are an emulation of would do in the same situation. They then diverge because they have differing experiences. They live in a different world. So their behavior is very predictable. An emulation is in virtual reality, but virtual reality still needs real resources. For every minute they experience, Somebody somewhere had to work to pay for it. And because it's so easy to make copies of emulations, you just make more computers and copy the software, the population of emulations grows very quickly so that the wages for emulations fall to M subsistence levels. That is, M's have to work most of the time in order to be able to pay for the resources they need to exist. Now, they mostly live and work in virtual reality, which can be beautiful and luxurious. So these are typical emulation scenes. However, they're mostly desks because they're working most of the time. But they're selected for loving their job, so they're not miserable, even if the, and they're living in this sort of environment. Now, we've been describing emulation's world from their point of view. Now let's stand back and look at their entire world from a distance. First, this economy can grow much faster than our economy does, because our economy is limited by the fact that population can't grow very fast, even though we can grow capital very fast. Our economy can't grow as fast as a robot economy can, which could plausibly double every month or so, much faster. So all the change we've seen in the entire industrial era could fit in a year or two, after which I'm not really willing to guess what happens next. That's the entire M era, a year or two. The typical emulation is even faster. I estimate the typical emulation runs 1,000 times human speed. And at that speed, their world seems to change more slowly than your world does for you. They are in a more stable world from their point of view. And they will experience thousands of years in this year or two that humans on the outside would experience. Because they can live and work in virtual reality, commuting costs are much less. And so they can probably all cram together into a small number of very dense cities. This is an extreme city of the future. Because they're all in a small number of dense cities, most war is cyber war, they are mostly self-sufficient, and most of the rest of the Earth is left to the humans far away from the M cities. Speaking of humans, they must all retire all at once for good. Now, most of the capital in this world, most of the income, is owned by the humans at the start. They own most stock and real estate. So if the economy doubles every month, emulation wealth doubles every, I mean, human wealth doubles every month. So humans collectively are getting very rich very fast. However, most people today don't own much beyond their ability to work. 
between now and then, they need to acquire sufficient insurance or sharing arrangements or they may starve. I highly recommend we do something about that <laughs> between now and then. You may wonder, why would emulations let humans exist? Why don't we, they kill us and take our stuff? <laughs> but think, around us today we have retirees in the same situation. We could kill them and take their stuff. Why don't we? Well, you might think it's because we're kind and nice, but more plausibly it's because we share many institutions with them. If we tried that, it would be hard, and if we succeeded, everybody else would wonder who's next. We would threaten the institutions. And so more plausibly, the M's would allow the humans to retire in peace. You should worry less about the humans being killed than just the fact you don't know what happens after a year or two, and something else goes on, and I don't know what that is. Emulations are all copies of humans, so their mental styles are all within the human range. But they're not typical humans. They, most emulations are copies of the few hundred most productive humans. That means emulations as elite compared to humans as the typical Nobel Prize winner, Olympic gold medalist, head of state, billionaire. They are ele that elite and they know it. Emulations may look on humans with nostalgia and perhaps gratitude, but not so much respect, which is if you think about it, how you think about your ancestors. <laughs> We know many things about how more productive people today differ from the average, and we can use those to predict features of emulations. They will be smarter, conscientious, hardworking, middle-aged, because that's where a peak productivity is, uh, and religious even. These are all just things that correlate with productivity today, so I can just use those to predict things about emulations. But emulations aren't all one thing. They have enormous variety, just like we do. So they're going to encompass all the kinds of varieties that humans do because they come from humans. They'll have varieties in what industries they work in and professions and hobbies. And they'll also have new kinds of variety that we don't. One of those new kinds of variety is mind speed. Again, emulations can run fast or slow. They just cost more to run fast or slow. And plausibly, there's a linear range over which you can pay twice as much to run twice as fast that goes up to a million times faster than human speed and down to a billion times slower than human speed, an enormous range. Emulations at the top of this range are high status in many obvious ways. They embody more wealth, they host meetings, they know things first, they win arguments, uh, and they are just better. They can do more in a very literal sense. Emulations near the bottom of this range, they're mostly retirees. Retirement is, can be slow, and that makes it cheap. And they're like the ghosts of our literature. If you recall, ghosts are creatures who are all around us, and if we do a certain thing, we can interact with them, but they're obsessed with the past, they don't know much, they can't much influence our life, so really, what's the point? <laughs> and that's what these, human, these retirees are like. They also encompass a variety in the structure of their lives. Your life is simple. You start and then you end. But this is the structure of the life of an emulation who every day splits off short-term copies that work during that day and then end to retire at the end of that day. These short-term copies are all work, whereas the mainline copy has to pay to rest between workdays. So these are much cheaper. This is an opportunistic M. They make more copies of themselves whenever versions of themselves are in more demand, and they really don't know where their future is going. This is an M designer. Start out with a single, central, co coherent design for a large system, and then they split into copies who elaborate the details of that system, all the way down to each little part. And then they recurse back until one M has designed a much larger, more coherent system than we humans can today. This is an emulation plumber. Who remembers every day for the last 20 years they only ever worked one hour a day, a life of leisure. But what happened is, Every day when they were ready for work, a thousand copies were made, each of whom did that one hour plumbing job, and then all but one were erased or retired at the end of the day. Objectively, this emulation works well over 99% of the time. Subjectively, however, they remember a life of leisure. It can feel good to be an M. Again, this is your life, simple, start and then you end. This could be your life if at the beginning of a party, you took a drug that meant you wouldn't remember that party for the next day or ever after. I'm told some people do that. My question for you is, toward the end of this party, will you say to yourself, I'm about to die? That creature tomorrow, that's not me because they won't remember what happened at this party. You could have that attitude or you could say, I will go on tomorrow, I just won't remember what I did tonight. 
This is an emulation which makes a short-term copy. This has the same structure. They can either look at this no short-term copy as a new creature with a very short life about to die and be very unhappy with that, or they can see it as a part of themselves. They won't remember exactly what they did. I predict they'll have this second attitude, not because it's philosophically correct, because it helps M's get along in this world. M's who have this attitude are comfortable with making short-term copies, who then end and they don't remember the details. They can have an interview at the end, they can collect a video or notes, but they won't remember a lot of the details of what they did in the past. Memory is more expensive for emulation than it is for us. It costs them more to remember the specifics of things. For each thing they do, they'll ask themselves, is this worth remembering? And you are forced to remember many things you do that are pretty trivial and unimportant. They won't remember those things. They will remember the important parts of their life because they will pay to remember those. Now, this means that they can't accumulate as much expertise on the job. They can only accumulate expertise when they remember it and say, well, choose more carefully which tasks they do that they want to collect expertise from and then pay the price of remembering that. Now, Today, it's hard to meet celebrities. Their time is rare. For emulation, it's easy to meet celebrities. If you want to meet a celebrity, you just request it, and they can split off a new copy, and you can interact with that new copy. What's expensive is to have the celebrity remember that you interacted with them, because memory is expensive. But emulations can use this feature to an advantage. So today, if your national leader says, we must invade Iraq, and you say, why, and they say, can't tell you state secret, you have to wonder whether you can trust them. However, for an emulation, what they can do is they can make a copy of the person asking the question and a copy of the leader. Those two copies go together inside a safe, and inside the safe they can explain the secret reasons, but nothing comes out of the safe except one bit that comes from you back to the original person saying, am I convinced by their reasons? And that way, an M can know that a copy of them is persuaded that there is a good reason for invading Iraq, even though they don't know what that reason is. This allows M's to trust their leaders more than we do. <laughs> because, and they can trust their managers. And they can often be idealistic uh, in their head and still be realistic in their actions because they can trust copies of themselves who learn the realistic reasons for doing things. <laughs> and they just follow that copy's advice without actually having to have in their head the cynical reasons why they're really doing it. All right, I've been telling you a lot about the age of M. I know you're very eager to evaluate it. You're eager to decide if you love it or hate it. That's very natural. I worry, in fact, that you jump too quickly to evaluating, and you don't take enough time to actually get into the head of this world. Think about your ancestors from 1,000 years ago asked to evaluate your world. Would they have praised your world or not? Well, they probably love it or hate it, depending on the first few things they heard about it, because your world is really just weird, hard to understand. They should, you think, actually understand your world for a while before they evaluate you and your world. Similarly, this future world is strange and hard to understand. You should take some time to understand it before you make a judgment, maybe even read a whole book about it, like my book, The Age of M. <laughs> but to give you a quick summary here of key features, again, they mostly live and work in virtual reality. They never need to feel pain, hunger, grime, or disease. Their bodies are always beautiful. They're OK with ending. They're not afraid of death very much. They're actually more afraid of what's called mind theft, where somebody steals a copy of their mind and then tortures it or enslaves it to do things. There's a much larger population of M's here than there is humans. Billions or trillions very quickly develop. These M's are mostly find their lives worth living and are happy with what they do because they are selected for being very productive, and very productive people tend to like what they do. They live in much larger, more intricate cities than yours. If you've ever said, I couldn't live in a small town because there's not enough going on there, they probably say that about your world, <laughs> your cities too. Your cities, as glorious as they are, are small towns compared to their larger, much more intricate cities. This larger economy can afford to spend more on making better art and stories, uh, interior decorations, even mind drugs, because those all just take a larger economy to spend on it. So they just have very high quality arts compared to yours, even if they spend a smaller percentage of their economy on the art. They are the kind of people we praise, that you would give a great award to, that you would clap and celebrate. 
because they are, again, elite compared to the average human. They are the most productive, like Nobel Prize winners, et cetera. And their world, from their point of view, is more stable than your world is. However, on the negative side, they are working most of the time. And remember, that's how most humans ever were in history. Most animals always were living near subsistence. Most humans, until a few hundred years ago, were living near subsistence. And most, uh, maybe a billion people today are living near subsistence. It's not a strange hypothetical. We know what people do in that scenario. They mostly do what it takes to survive. There are these short-term copies you might not like, more inequality you might not like. There are other things you might not like. There's things you like. Again, think carefully before you decide whether you love or hate the age of M. And if there's something you don't like about it, do something about it. Thank you.